<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the library and to our program tonight. Um, it's an honor and a tribute to Eric Johnson, who we all knew and loved, dear friend and wonderful library trustee. Stephen is going to be doing the presentation tonight, and uh, Stephen is a logger and also he and his family live in this community. I'm just a know. forester, I'm not a logger. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a forester, okay. Wrong title, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, he and his family live in the, the community and they also love the library, right? Stephen? That's true. Yeah, okay, so please make him welcome. Thanks. Just, just a couple things before I start. I am recording this. Patty asked that I record it for the family, so I'm going to ask you to play along a little bit here. And if things drag or start to get really boring, stifle the yawns and just play along so we have some good ambient background noise. So, so and your reward will be lots of nice beverages and maple glazed popcorn after the after the presentation. So I've got to talk about logging from 1982 to 2017 and talk about Eric Johnson. And it's interesting that several of you knew Eric quite a bit better than I did. And um, there's a few people here that would be quick to tell you they know a whole lot more about logging than I do. But I'll try to, I'll try to pull both of these things together. Now, before I, I jump into this, how many people are from town here? All right. And how many people are here from the woods and from the working landscape? Quite a few. And, and I'm glad to see this mix, I think. People from town knew Eric as this terrific guy you could always count on. He was a library trustee and knew what a great guy he was. And it's good for the people from our industry to know that. But it's good for you local folks to see how well thought of Eric was uh, from the industry. I heard from several people this week that wanted to come and for whatever reason, weather and work, couldn't get up here. But Eric was known far and wide. How many of you were here in 2014 when we did the Mountain Battle the first of these, the Claude presentation. I have to tell you, I've done, gosh, over 250 public presentations at this point, and uh, I think that was my absolute favorite. It was because of the group we had there that, that night that was much like this. And a um, little background where Men of Metal came from and how, how we tie these together. Uh, I think I knew both of these guys well enough to tell you that they would be thrilled to be associated with each other in this way. I didn't know this would turn into a series, and I, I hope we don't have a need for any others, but I can't think of any other uh, intersection between the library and the, the forestry world that had quite the impact of, of these two guys, and uh, I think of them in, this, in the same breath. So Meta Metal comes from this Philip Goodwin print. Back when we did the Claude presentation and put that on, I searched high and low for a, uh, a high-resolution version of that to use in the poster, and I never did find it, but we, we stuck with the title. You can tell this is a good one, Trent. There's always a guy in a red shirt doing something really important. <laughs> well, I'll try to talk about Eric tonight and about logging and, and tie the two of them together. Um, when I started to pull this together and try to think of some themes to carry through and that sort of thing, I asked my wife how long this should be because I could go about four hours, and she said quite a bit less longer than, than you think it ought. This is a Ken Bronner print. And it's a favorite of mine, but it goes back to an era before Eric's time, certainly before my time, uh, though there's some people in the room that got their start with, with track machines. And that goes back uh, to the 70s before, you know, before we, the rubber tired skitters really took over here. And even by the time Eric started and later on in the 80s when I showed up here and started working, we were cutting in some places for the first time with rubber tired machines. Everything had been done with tracks prior to that. Well. I was able to go and do some research up at the Northern Logger and look back through some old copies in the magazine. And I pinpointed the exact moment when Eric showed up. One month it was this. Editor, George Mitchell, nobody, Noreen Lincoln. Everybody knows who Noreen is, right? Mona. Yeah, Mona. <laughs> Mona. So look at this. That must have been a great place to work. And then Eric shows up and, and, and Mona got the perfect coworker. And George got a great protege. And really, uh, by the time I started popping in there in, in the 90s, there was a terrific bunch of people to see. You'd walk in, there was Donna Greco always smiling at everybody. Pam Leach was there. Mary Moore was there for a time. Uh, 
Nancy Petrie and, and others. And it was a great place. But I, I, I think about this. Eric shows up, George, Mona, and I think Eric was kind of a rose between two thorns there. <laughs> So that, that introductory issue, when, when Eric first came on the scene, gave us some background. He came here from, from Wisconsin. He's a Badger, a University of Wisconsin grad in journalism. And he worked his way through college cutting pulpwood. And if you're wondering what the heck's going on there, this is what they do in the Lake States. They put the, they put the wood on the truck sideways, and they do, they do that a little bit in Maine, too. Eric had combined newspaper and woods work for a time and had a background, a family tree farm that dated back to the 50s that uh, I'll talk more about a little bit later on. And he came here and, you know, being from a different place, he brought something that I think is a little bit in short supply in northern New York and central New York. Uh, just a pleasant outlook on things. Uh, I have a friend who spent her whole career here, but it's from northern Minnesota, and she said she spent the whole time explaining she wasn't really from the Midwest. She was from the upper central area, and some good folks came from there. So Eric, as you know, was editor of the Northern Logger, but he was quite a bit more than that. He was quite a bit more accomplished than that, and that he edited everything. How many of you knew that he edited National Woodlands Magazine? Yeah, a few of you, and that, that's a magazine that went out to people all over the country. And another one kind of close to his heart, and, and a little bit more recent, was Wisconsin Woodlands. Because as he spent more time back home in Wisconsin at the tree farm, he became more involved in things there, and really enjoyed being involved with this publication. And of course, he was the editor of the bookmark, right? He was, he was a trustee at the library. He was somebody that could be counted on for a lot of things, and he edited that. I got to know Eric quite a bit as an editor because we worked on some books. I know he took particular satisfaction in working on this, I believe it was this book with his father. Uh, heavy firewood theme in there because the, the acorn doesn't fall too far from the tree there. I, I worked with Eric on uh, six books where he either edited or did layout. And I have to tell you, editors can be unpleasant. He wasn't one of those. I think Thomas Sowell devotes a whole chapter to his autobiography on how much he hated dealing with editors. Eric was always a pleasure to deal with because he was an excellent writer. He was confident. He didn't feel the need to wordsmith your work. Uh, but the only thing we disagreed about was whether you could start a sentence with and or not. And, and eight, eight years of Catholic school cured me of the idea that that would be allowed. So a couple stories about this. You know, we. We put some things out and you work on it and you think you got it all and sometimes there's a little mistake and we, we shared the blame. But uh, the only thing worse than spelling your wife's name wrong in the acknowledgement <laughs> section of a book <laughs> is when your mother-in-law is the first one to notice. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to pin that on Eric, but he wasn't going for that. He managed on one of these others, though he spelled Northeastern wrong, so I got him back there. Quick story about this publication the con in, the, in the lower corner there, Improving Hardwood Log Values. That was uh, a book that I helped edit, Eric and I, and Eric did the layout. Scott Noble is a, a terrific forester from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And he, Mona and I had a big training project with him. So he wrote this and Eric worked on it and he was getting close to being done and then had to take off to be at the, the annual expo up in Essex Junction. And I go up there and I look over and there's Eric talking to the governor, governor of Vermont. And he looks over the governor's shoulder and he sees me and he blows off the governor to go tell me he's finished working on this publication. <laughs> the governor's not thought of as royalty over there like he is in some other places. I want to say a few things about the Northern Logger, or more, more properly the Northeastern Loggers Association. And there's a photo that Eric snapped. Probably he followed that load of logs through town and couldn't resist taking a photo of it. Um, and by the way, most of the photos that I have here, any that involve Eric, were, were Eric's own photos, and Mona Lincoln did a great job of combing through his hard drive and giving me a lot to work with there. Um, the Northern Logger is a little bit of a sleeping giant, and, the, and I use this, this logo because, well, because I like beer, but also because it kind of proves my, my point in that sense. Uh, people know that you know a lot of nice people work there and there's good jobs there, but sometimes uh, in town here we don't realize how far and wide the influence of this organization is. And, and the fact that there are people from all over here tonight is kind of a testament to that. And there's a pretty good intersection between the, the, the library and the Northern Logger and that you know the hallmark of any good organization, I don't care if it's a business 
or you know a nonprofit or whatever is fiscal responsibility and low staff turnover. And if you look at those two things, it's no wonder there's such a connection between the two places. Quick story, I was in Minneapolis in the 90s at a Forest Product Society uh, meeting and I was introduced to the head of the Southern Research State, Forest Service Southern Research Station in New Orleans is where he worked. He said, so where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from O'Carroll Lakes. <laughs> and he, he hadn't quite heard of it, believe it or not. So I said, well, it's just outside Old Forge. And he said, Old Forge, that's the home of the Northern Logger. <laughs> and it turns out he was a he was a youper from Escanaba and he had written an article early in his career that was in the Northern Logger. All right, before I talk about logging, I just want to talk a little bit about Eric. I had so many good photos to pick from. And because Eric was such a polite and, uh, and mild-mannered guy, I'm not sure everybody realized that he was an absolute superhuman physical specimen of an athlete and a guy. He was uh, always cutting firewood. I roped him in to help me build a couple of skitter bridges. Loved to ski. That, that picture is out at his tree farm in Wisconsin. And then he biked, and he biked extensively. And when he went down to Clinton, he started biking far and wide down there, and he would go down into Madison County and so on. And he, he told me once, he said, I'm out there with my outfit on biking along, and I see people, and they're cutting wood, and they're skidders, and they're loading trucks. I want to stop and say, hi, I'm not just guy in tight shorts. You know, I'm one of you, really. <laughs> and he really was one of those people. My, my daughter has a story of, of um, She looks like she wants seeing, to jump up and oh, tell. She's a sleeping teacher. Yeah. Um, she was down, what's the name of that bridge? Hawkinsville. In, in Hawkinsville. <laughs> and Eric had ridden his bike to Old Forge, to the Northern Logger, mm. and was going back to Clinton through the through Hawkinsville. Hawkinsville. Yeah. Wherever, through Hawkinsville. And you were taking pictures of the kids, yeah. and he was riding his bike. <laughs> he stopped to look at the venue, and I said, Eric! <laughs> <laughs> so, the other thing he loved to do yeah. was garden. So. Yeah. And I have I have somewhere a picture of him with a woodchuck he shot in the garden holding up there. So so I had a lot of correspondence with Eric and I was able to look back through and it was kind of a interesting thing to do this week and I thought about him an awful lot but I pulled one up and then as of 2015 he had had 106 rounds of chemo, 106 rounds, right? And he would drink some ginger tea and he would get on his bike and away he would go. He had the best attitude of anybody I have ever talked to. Uh, about anything like that, you know, uh, he was a great guy to get advice about if you had any of the slightest health thing, you felt pretty good after you talked to him, really. Uh, when I first put my wood boiler in, uh, gave my wife about a two minute briefing on how to run it and thought she'd be an expert. And of course I went away and the best thing to, to happen to you when you're 500 miles away is get a call and say, it's no heat, right? So Eric stopped over and got it going and you know, we come to find out later he'd had chemo that. Let there be no doubt, though, he wasn't just a guy in tight shorts, and I've got that. Here's a picture. I'm pretty sure that's with his, his dad out at the tree farm. But he said, hey, Steve, next time we sell some logs, why don't we cut down that big old cherry tree outside my office window? There's probably 32 feet of large diameter saw log in it. It's got a busted top, so we should salvage it while there still has some value. Believe me, he thinks like a logger and not like a guy in tight shorts. All right, so now's the part where I get to talk about logging, and conveniently, everything you know, need to know about logging is in this one little <laughs> infographic here. So all you need to really take away from this is there are some simple systems, and there are some more complicated systems. And depending on what kind of timber you're going to cut under what circumstances, you might use a different system. So we have largely three ground-based types of systems for harvesting timber, and I'm going to talk about each one of these a little bit and how over Eric's time in this industry, how we evolved from that very simple set to the more expensive set and why. And uh, if we look at this, so we have a tree length system or what a lot of people like to call conventional logging, what, what people are most familiar with. Guy with a chainsaw cuts down trees, bring it out with a cable skitter and then you cut it up and load it on the truck. There's also cut to length harvesting. I'll talk about that quite a bit and whole tree, but by volume at least, most of the wood, at least in the northern forest, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine is cut with these whole tree systems. Quite a bit is done by cut to length, which is the best way to do it some of the time, right? And then this tree length system will persist forever. So I wanna talk about each of these 
so we can have some logging in this talk as well. So a tree length system, when do we do this? When do we use it? Well, when you've got big trees, they're kind of far apart. And this is an ad from the from the magazine from back from Eric's early days. The, the, gra the, the cable skitter persists and will persist for a long time to come, I think. I did see a three-wheeler in a nearby town not too long ago, but there aren't too many of those left left around there, and and they they don't throw them in they don't throw much in for free anymore when you buy a skitter. So tree length system is that hand felling. These are some some great Kathleen Kolb paintings uh, from Vermont. Vermont they really celebrate the working landscape a little bit more, so they the state or somebody commissioned her to do these, but it shows that kind of logging, cutting big trees by hand. And that system's great. When I started and when Eric started, that's pretty much what was done. Uh, a bigger system might mean more skitters or that sort of thing. But a funny thing happened. We all took part in it. You know, the, one of my favorite books is The Big Sky, and the theme is each man kills the thing they love. Well, you know, the quarter of the timber with three quarters of the value was what got cut first. And suddenly we had a whole lot of stems that didn't have nearly as much value. And we had to figure out an efficient way to handle it. And maybe hand cutting wasn't quite it. So that then we started this evolution towards some, some new equipment. And we go back to the early, uh, so some of the early ads in the Northern Logger as we evolved into a whole tree system, the Han Harvester. You guys had a Han, right, John? Two. Two. So you were one of the early adapters. And actually mechanized logging. <laughs> yeah. Before my time. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> mechanized logging in a lot of ways got its start um, in this region, in this town, right, with your dad and with Sid yeah. Payne buying equipment. Um, and that was back at a time when everybody who lived here knew somebody that worked in the woods. There were just, there were more people doing that kind of work. First time I ever talked to Robert Moore was on the side of Dead Man Mountain when he was skidding wood, right? Didn't know I'd be talking to him at the Art Center yesterday. No, had, had no, no clue. So, and then this came along, the slasher. You could be in the cab of your loader and the tree came into the landing and you could pick it up and cut it. And, you know, these had been around a little while when I got here, but this took a while for people to get used to because that big saw cuts the end of the log. It's not quite as clean. And if you cut soft wood, it looks like it's been ripped. And there were some people that said, hey, this is rotten wood, you know, and it took a little while for people to get used to it. And now they're, they're commonplace. Everybody's using one. When I asked one of the, one of the loggers I talked to a lot, what's the di biggest difference? <laughs> In your time, he says, it's the way we cut down trees. Now, no matter what Chuck Norris thinks, we're always going to cut down some trees with a chainsaw. But really, as we started to move towards mechanization, it, it meant cutting trees with machines. And another logger, and a logger who's got you know, a lot of employees and a lot of equipment said, you know, I saw that, and it didn't mean a thing to me until I saw I stroke the limber. Because it doesn't matter how fast you cut the trees down, they only leave the landing as fast as you can process it. Right, so a system's only as fast as its slowest part. So once he saw a stroke delimiter, it clicked for him, and, and he's been one of the leading mechanized loggers ever since. Now, as the size of the timber you're going to cut gets smaller and its value per unit gets lower, funny thing, the capital investment that it takes to efficiently handle it goes way up. If you're able to just cut big trees, good for you, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money to be able to afford to do it. But if you're going to cut little low value trees, you gotta have real mechanized equipment. And if you're gonna do that, you probably invested a lot in it and suddenly you need a shop to keep it up. And suddenly you can't just log part of the year and maybe do something else. You're gonna be uh, busy keeping up with payments and that sort of thing. So you gotta really go at it quite a bit more. So that's how we saw mechanization come in. and I, I went back through and looked at some of Eric's quotes, and, his, and here's, a, here's a great one from one of his editorials. Machines are oblivious to conditions that drive human loggers out of the woods and can work exhaustively every day of the year around the clock. Well, some human loggers are exhausted. Not this guy, right, John? <laughs> Funny thing, though, the pile never gets any bigger. <laughs> Eric was quick to add, because Eric was a people person first, he was quick to add, it would be a mistake to let the bottom line alone dictate our actions. So this is a slide I use when I'm trying to explain depreciation to logger, to actually to foresters. You know, you use the machine, 
and then it wears out and its value goes down. But I always have to point out that money's not falling from the sky. It's going the other way. Since we had the St. Patrick's Day parade, if you look really close, there's a leprechaun in the corner here. <laughs> so the whole tree system, you've got to figure out how you're going to cut the tree down and then how many grapple skitters you need. Hopefully only one, but maybe more. And then you might do a whole lot of other things with it. You know, you could cut it up, put it on the truck and drag the tops back to the woods or maybe you put them through a chipper or something like that. Tree system. So here's a look at some of the felling. Now this is down in the flat rock demonstration forest. And this is a very skilled operator, Keith, Keith Hubbard out of Tupper Lake. He went through and, you know, all the poor stems are gone. Now this isn't quite a commercial harvest, but he did a thinning. Uh, the good stems, the sugar maple, the yellow birch are left behind cut the beach understory out, and he went through and systematically did that. That would be very difficult and time consuming to do by hand. Here's another look kind of at the same process. You can take great pictures of one of those machines up close if you use a trail camera and if you're willing to lose a trail camera. Yeah. Everybody see the deer, the little buck here? Sadly, he's not with us anymore. Wasn't me. All right, well, that's tree length, like, but, but, or whole tree harvesting, but how about this idea of cut to length harvesting? It's been around for quite a while, and it's been adopted widely in some places and a little slower to catch on in others. And, and Eric always wondered about that. We had a few conversations, and he thought it was a question of marketing. There may have been a bit more to it. So the early ones didn't carry a whole lot. This is actually Eric's forwarder, the one his dad had built from a skitter that they use out used out at the tree farm in Wisconsin and for what he was doing out there it was really an ideal setup. Cut to length is a great way to harvest timber of a certain size not too small not too big uh, in a fairly high harvesting intensity and if you're not going to move it for miles and miles. So it works well in plantations but it's not you know exclusively for that not at all. This is a uh, Norway spruce plantation in uh, Allegheny County. If you look, they went through there and put those on the ground and the ones that they want to keep are still in pretty good shape. This is a uh, red pine stand down by Cobleskill. And this guy's a pretty skilled operator. Eric did that cut to length harvesting. I'm gonna talk a little more about the family forest later on, but I had this great photo and I wanted to show you this. Some of you know his son, Jason, who grew up here. And in recent years, I think Eric took a lot of satisfaction from being able to work with Jason out there. But the, the whole cut to length thing really took off in the Lake States um, in part and in, in places like Northern Maine and some other some other places uh, where you don't have, I suppose they have hills out there. They, won't have, they don't have what I call mountains. And I think I have more boulders in my yard than they have in the whole state there. So they have the type of terrain that it works well for. This is a high production system in Aroostook County, Maine. That's the Voice Inn Brothers outfit, and uh, they they do pretty well with it. They uh, they do things differently. They're able to bring the wood out and pile it along the road front. They've got an alley along behind it, and if you go out to the site, instead of a central landing where, like we're used to seeing here, you might see a pile of wood that's 1,000 feet or more long. It's just a very efficient system for that landscape. Cut the length system lets you do things like these early commercial thinnings. They just use a little bit smaller system and they're able to take tree and there's a specialized sawmill up there in Ashland that handles these really small, really small logs. So it's a great system in certain situations. Now, unfortunately here in the Northeast, you can read this terrain map. Guess where most of the timberland is? It's not down on the flat ground, is it? No. So it's in places where it can be very difficult. And so we've had, I think, Town of Webb, you cut in 2006 down here, Tom, with your cut to length. I don't think there's been a cut to length job here since. There's been <laughs> there was one this winter on the Lee Club, but that was actually over in Ohio, so that was wasn't our. But there's a reason for that. It's 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 uh, hard to move wood long distances that way. Other times you'd say, hey, this is the best thing going. Well, I could go on a better part the better part of the night talking about different things going on in logging, but I thought I'll just pick a few topics to touch on. Uh, to, to kind of uh, fill the rest of the presentation here. Eric would do uh, 
a trends issue once a year for the Northern Logger and touch on different things that were going on. So I just picked a collection of topics that I'll, I'll say a few things about as we go through here. And I don't know what's going to come up next year. Ah, one of the big differences in how we do things from, you know, over the course of Eric's time, and let me back up. I think I told Mona that I used orange in the poster and, and, <laughs> and it's a slide background because that's her favorite color and that was <laughs> at least a little true. But mostly it's symbolic of safety and the fact that it matches the good photos I had of Eric do here. So um, there's probably a greater emphasis on safety that, that came about over the past 35 years here. Certainly, Jeff, you know you know a lot about this and the backstory on it. That's not to say that there weren't people that worked safely before that. But nowadays, nobody's learning how to cut a tree down from a pack of cigarettes. And this, this goes back to quite a bit, quite a bit earlier time. But, uh, you know, directional felling with game logging has uh, a lot of emphasis has been put on that. Uh, that's not to say it's the only way to cut trees down, but it's a safer way to cut trees down. And that's that's been uh, one of the big changes. Workman's comp, and part of it was dictated. Workman's comp is such, such an issue and the need to cover workers with it. Uh, that in order to keep rates down, you got to do loss prevention and training and make sure you've got good, safe workers. Here in New York State, uh, Jeff's company in particular has done a great job with that. There are states where it's really prohibitive to have any employees because of that, and that distorts how, how things are done. So workman's comp has been a, a big issue and was a big issue over the course of Eric's career. Another thing happened. So if we go back to all that mechanization that went on, Suddenly, it wasn't just an owner-operator with one machine or two machines and one employee. If you're going to have one crew, one big crew, why not have two? And if you're going to do that, can the owner really be an operator? Or do they have to be more, and a bit more of an executive? And we've seen that. You see that quite a bit in Maine. Uh, less so here. There's still a lot of owner-operators, and that's, that's not a bad thing. But you see some people whose job is to ensure that the crew can always work. There's always a good harvesting site to go to, so they spend their time on that, that if something goes wrong, because once in a while something goes wrong in logging, right? Something goes wrong, the right parts are there, the people are there to fix it, the, there's no lost time. And that's, you know, as we've seen this, this move towards uh, a more business-like approach for some. Eric was quick to jump on any trend and report about it. Skyline logging comes to New York, that's a 1984 issue. I wouldn't call it a trend. I think it came and it went. So, you know, you don't nail every trend, but uh, I can't think of many places where skyline logging makes a great deal of sense here. A couple things I want to say about this. Now, Eric was a great one for having a positive message. I think he was really unimpressed that all through grad school I had a bumper sticker that said, Earth first, we'll log the other planets later. He, he, he was more, let's let's emphasize the positive. So that's the message here. And, and over the course of his time, we started to see more recognition of the working landscape. We still lag behind other places like Vermont or Maine, but you know, working lands sustain themselves. And there is some recognition. Some of the environmental groups get this, um, but I like to put it this way. Every time you see a truckload of logs or pulp, that's helping sustain 73 acres of open space in the state every single year. And hey, did you know that it's good luck to see a log truck? <laughs> My daughter made that up. <laughs> and I'll buy it. Yeah. My daughter Fern made that up. I like that one. Everything's made up, Fred. And uh, anybody ever get stuck behind a log truck? <laughs> yeah. And you know how I feel when I get stuck behind a trailer load of snowmobiles, huh? Or a camper. All right, this is interesting. The microchip age has begun to revolutionize our industry as well. Now, this was back in the 80s. To me, microchips are the kind of small wood chips you make so you don't send emerald ash borer over into Vermont or something like that. But microchip age, computers now make decisions and draw up plans to save time and money for everyone, from the smallest logging contract to the largest pulp mill. You might have been a little early with this. But hey, here's an ad from a 19, late 80s or early 90s. Um, Northern Logger, Forestry Suppliers, look at the five and a quarter disc. Yeah. I saw that and I laughed and then I thought, no, I've been selling my software Forestry Suppliers since 1998 and I haven't updated it once. So I'm just as bad as the rest of them. If I, I can't tell you how many I've, times I've been told by people 
who should know better that, hey, loggers don't have computers. Loggers don't know how to use computers. Loggers don't have smartphones. I'm here to tell you otherwise. And I've got proof. You want to be a logger? There's an app for that. You know, loggers are pretty creative and inventive and, and quick to grab anything that is going to help them in their work. And this has made people work safer. Uh, and, it, and it's helped people to be a little bit more efficient. And in fact, pretty sure the very first, first logging app class ever taught in New York State happened right here in this room last year. Am I right? Yeah. Another tie between the industry and the library. <coughs> No, that's not Namish Mill. Is that yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> this, but, well, I'm going somewhere with this, but bear with me. Loggers have had to find additional revenue streams. Well, that's running. It's, everybody can't run an antique sawmill. Some people can, though, right, Fran? Well, whether it's running a sawmill, a portable mill, a firewood processor or sugar bush doing excavation work. That's how Claude started to transition over. Or like my young friend Josh Risch here, hauling moose out of the woods. Josh is in Southern Aroostook County and that machine works three hour, sh eight hour shifts per day. And yet he still found time to bring moose out. And as he told me, he made a lot more money <laughs> carting moose that day than he did <laughs> cutting pulpwood. So additional revenue streams, taking your talent and doing more things with it. This is one of those clips that made the rounds. That truck's for sale, Fran, if you want it. <laughs> I sent this to Eric, and there's a whole long, there's a whole series of these Russian clips. I sent this, this to Eric, and right away he wrote me back, I'd like to see the Russian yeah. BMP manual. Look like, looks like those guys might be out of compliance. This is another thing that's really happened over the course of Eric's career is we went from BMPs, what's that, SMZs, all that, to genuine concern for water quality. We've got BMP standards, every state's got them. There's some good common sense things in there. There's some things we're not always happy with. And as we see here, uh, here's a portable bridge on the Moose River. This was a little while back and Fran's somewhere there hiding, but there's Clint Carpenter as they put that in. Now, if you look closely here, this is the site of an old driving dam and where we used to just run the logs right down the river. We carefully crossed that. You you, you bridged in the North Branch two years in a row there, right? Skid, skid one year and truck the other on that site and you built a heck of a good bridge there. So concern for water quality has been much more. Uh, the logging community has embraced this in an innovated way, in a, innovated a lot of ways of protecting, protecting the, the water. Another thing that happened, funny thing happened over the course of this, this 80s to now is we started to take our best logs and send them far away, right? So uh, when Eric first got started, there were opportunities with the Japanese and we were really worried what were the Japanese were going to do. And some of you remember when we sent a whole lot, there was a bowling craze and we sent a lot of hard maple over there. And uh, today we're worried about the Chinese. We haven't heard much about the Japanese or, or we're not so much worried about them as we wonder, will they come and buy our logs, right? It used to be that just these better quality logs went overseas. They went to the Pacific Rim or to Europe. And um, in this last round, going back, say, 2008, nine, and since, a lot of the hardwood sawmills closed, consolidated, and we saw a little bit of a lack of competition. And, and as we've seen an uptick in the economy, uh, exporters, in particular to China, have jumped in. And now they don't just want the best logs. They'll take some pretty poor logs and send them over there. If you're a sawmill, that, that's no fun. If you're a landowner or a logger selling wood and, and have more competition, hey, that's not bad. A couple of you are wondering, those are not truck drivers. All right, fuel. Fuel used to be kind of an afterthought if you go back to, uh, you know, the 80s. And, uh, yeah, it was a cost of doing business, but a bu buck a gallon or something like that, it wasn't something you talked about. I had one logger with 100 employees, a big logger, tells me every day he gets at 4, four o'clock and the first thing he does is ch check the, the price of fuel. When, when fuel went to 3 and 4 and even $5 a gallon for off-road fuel, that caused some innovation, like uh, things like there, there's a fuel tank and, and what do they do with that? The forwarder in this case, or a skidder, can take that and cut it out to the woods with them so the cutting machine doesn't have to come all the way out to the landing and waste fuel to, 
before it fuels up. So you see that kind of innovation going on there. Remember in 1985 paying $1.35 Tupper Lake for gas and thinking they were bandits up there. <laughs> Wood energy. So here's a big trend and it ties nicely into to things that, that Eric was concerned with. Uh, some of you know Eric, you know, you know he was a firewood enthusiast, but he was a, really a wood boiler enthusiast as well. And on the hearth.com website, he was one of those go-to sources. That's a whole community of people who are in love with their boilers and share information and help each other out. His, this was his tagline on Ellis Post. And incidentally, they're still up there. If you're wondering how to fix your boiler, you might go find some of Eric's words of wisdom on that site. But I like a source of fuel where the price, supply, and quality are controlled by one guy, me. Eric loved firewood. I think thermal energy, it's here to stay. It probably won't take off to the extent we'd like it to. Um, electricity, well, Lionsdale close. And maybe it'll open again someday, I don't know. And then this idea that we can make some transportation fuels out of wood that we've been hearing about for 20 years, just around the corner. It's still just around the corner. So 15 years from now, we'll still be talking about it. Um, during, during over the, well, during Eric's career, wood heating really took off at the institutional scale in certain places. And how many of you knew that the first wood chip heating fuels in New York State were made in the town of Webb? By John's dad, right? That was a start. In Vermont, a third of the kids go to a wood heated school. It's a great idea. I couldn't, probably would never work here because you have to have certain things. You need, um, you need cold, long cold winters, expensive oil, need a big space to heat, abundant renewable supply of wood. <laughs> hmm. I think there's some institutional. <laughs> Eric was just obsessed with firewood. I, th I grew growing up, I thought my dad was obsessed with it, and my girls think I am, and we're not. Eric, you know, I go back to my correspondence, and he's always talking about firewood. He'd just been in Wisconsin, and he was happy because his sister had been taught how to on her soapstone stove and she had plenty of dry wood in the freezer or in the, in the freezer in the in the woodshed uh and there's a lot of photos of eric now some of you will recognize that beach eric just loved to cut wood and that, that's 22 or 24 inch beach sometimes beach splits well and sometimes not but there's a world of difference between splitting, splitting a 16 inch block of wood and one that's 22 inches and he split all of his by hand and i think he was heating over 3,000 square feet down there in Clinton. He just loved to split wood. Well, we, when he lived in town and when he uh, rented from George there, he would call up DeForest Flansburg and Big D would bring him a load of, load of beach and he'd cut it up and well, he loved that, but it wasn't quite enough for him. You know, when they bought the Flat Rock Forest down there, he was out there all the time. He had a year's worth of wood ahead on the ground. Um, if I needed to talk to him, I'd listen and late in the day, he would up, be out in the woods behind my house and I'd go up there and Sure enough, there's Eric cutting wood after he's worked all day. Love to do it. Eric is the, the reason my daughter, Darby, knows all about gasifiers. Right? So a gasifier will make you a truer believer in dry wood. So that boiler um, burns under low temperatures, burns the wood, and forces the gas down, and that flume takes off. So Darby, when she was two and a half, could tell me when the boiler wasn't gasifying correctly, right? And I would go and check it. And while I'm telling you about Darby, before you leave here, there's an honorable mention piece of mermaid art here with Darby's name. <laughs> Some of you know I like to, to brag about my daughters. Well, I learned from the best because uh, Eric always told me about Sarah. I probably met Sarah once. I know all about when she got a uh, summer job in Clinton, waiting tables in town. And then when she went out down to SUNY Oneana and when she moved out to San Francisco and got a great job out there. So I learned from the best on that. Here's another quote from Eric. My main problem is I get greedy and try to make my piles too high. And you see there, he's got them almost six feet tall. I don't know, this is a friend of his and I'm not sure if they bonded over their shared <laughs> operations. And I, I suspect that's what happened. And Eric converted him to firewood, convinced him, hey, firewood is a great, great exercise. And, he looks like he's buying into it. I had a lot of, you know, if I tried to get a hold of him in the summer when he was out, out in Wisconsin, I'd get a note like this. Cutting firewood up at our family tree farm in Wisconsin. I had a blast. Here's a great picture. Jason, Patty, Sarah, and Eric together out there. The family tree farm meant an awful lot to him. 
And uh, the last few years in particular, I think they spent a lot of good quality family time there. Eric, well, that's a tree farm. And as somebody who writes forest management plans for a living, I can tell you Eric had a great plan figured out and has a great plan in place going forward uh, there. And it had been his intention going into retirement to kind of cut wood on a sustainable basis and you know help his mother out and all that. So he had a great plan um, and a pretty good program in place. All right, well, as I talk about the Johnson era and forest industry and eras and long and distinct period of history with a particular feature or characteristic, I'm always gonna associate this, this period of time with Eric, his, his uh, positive outlook, his decency, you know, the fact that you could always count on him, just always a bright voice, um, always trying to tell the logger story in a very positive way. Are we not drawn to a new era? We're not drawn onward to a new era. If you try reading that backwards, it'll sort of make sense. So at the beginning of the year, uh, they debuted a new look for the Northern Logger, but hey, Eric was the one that designed this look. So his work lives on there. Recently, they had a, a terrific podcast, the first, I think, of a series. I'd encourage you all to listen to it because it's very well done. And, you know, one era might draw to a close, but, you know, everything will build on what Eric has done there. And, um, you know, the new era could be just as great. I want to go back to that first introduction of, of Eric in, in 1982 when he came on board. And, and this is a quote from him. And he sort of knew what he was talking about then. Loggers have told me that once you work in the woods, you're hooked for life because it has that special appeal. Writers have said that the successful writer brings out the true feeling of his subject. Given that, it seems to me I'm cut out to write about logging and the people who were involved with it. And then he just lived that for the next 35 years. I don't, I don't know what else to say about that. I'm gonna miss Eric. Uh, that's how he lived and how his career was. He was an important part of the community. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here today and to talk to you all, all about this. Thanks very much.